It's the risk that gives the protest its power. Those wise words come from today's guest, Dave Zirin. Dave has been writing for years about sports through a political lens. He's also the sports editor for The Nation magazine and host of the Edge of Sports podcast. In 2011, he co-wrote a book with former star Olympian John Carlos, who raised a fist in a Black Power salute at the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City. His most recent book looks to Colin Kaepernick, but it's more about the wave of activism that sprung up once Cap started to kneel during the national anthem in 2016. So we'll get into all of that, the sacrifice and the obstacles that come with standing up or taking a knee for what's right. Now let's get to it. Here's my conversation with the always excellent Dave Zion. I, I, I really want to congratulate you. I mean, on your 11th book, The Kaepernick Effect, Taking a Knee, Changing the World, um, you've written so many, but I, I was truly blown away by it. And I think on the impetus of a new NFL season, there's so much to be said about where we are now, politic-wise, sports-wise, but I want you to take me back to that moment in time and explain why you chose that action as the framing of your book relating to Cap and taking a knee around the national anthem. This is a book called The Kaepernick Effect that's not even necessarily about Colin Kaepernick, but of course it's framed by his actions. You see, I believe that Colin Kaepernick made a tremendous gift to the world of not just sports, but the world of activism, the world of protest, the world of direct action, uh, the world of civil disobedience. And what he did was he bequeathed a language that anybody could replicate. That's the gift that Colin Kaepernick bequeathed to a generation of young athletes. And so what I set about doing was trying to find athletes across the country who took that knee. Now that's the original reason why I wrote the book, like just because I wanted this history to be preserved and to have it not be thrown into the memory hole as these people's histories so often are. As I was putting the book in the hands of my publisher was the summer of 2020. It was Hmm. the police killing of George Floyd. I went back, I said to the publisher, stop the presses. And I went back, it was the largest set of demonstrations in the history of the United States. So I went about calling every single person that I interviewed. And it turns out every single one, without exception, was either in the streets or organizing people to get in the streets or speaking out and inspiring people to get into the streets. And that made me realize that while many roads may have led us to the summer of 2020, one of them ran straight through the athletic fields of the United States. And that's a story worth telling. In, in the sports sphere, you would hear a lot of feedback from people saying, I don't come to listen and watch athletics to hear politics. Yeah, I mean, what I found was that while people say sports and politics don't mix, what they really mean is that sports and a certain kind of politics don't mix. You know, I'll never forget young one, young woman who, who took a knee at a very small college in Iowa and found herself basically kicked out of school for it. She said to me, you know, I made people feel uncomfortable. But what I would always say to them is if you feel uncomfortable for four minutes, then maybe you have a sense of what it's like to be a black girl from the city coming to rural Iowa to play sports. Maybe you know how I feel 24 hours a day. You now get that for four minutes. So that was the goal. And I also think that's what spurred a great deal of of the resentment. I mean, it was a polarizing thing, like some people in the stands, and let's be clear, when I say some people, I'm talking about some white people. Uh, Some people, some white people were like, wow, you know, maybe this is something that we should listen to. Dave, I'm just sitting here thinking about all the things that went down for Colin and all the aftermath. How prepared do you think he actually was for that, to be so central to this movement? You know, I think for Colin, this was a case of having greatness thrust upon him. I mean, he was not someone who grew up in an activist family. He was somebody who in the summer of 2016 was just incredibly frustrated by seeing the killings of people like Philando Castile and Alton Sterling, killings caught on camera that then went viral, which is its own real form of of violence and psychological torment that I don't think we talk about nearly enough. Like, yes, it's a good thing that we get to videotape people more easily, videotape police and and create more of a culture of accountability, which frankly just did not exist 
before phones and videotape and the rest of it. Yet that also produces a culture of trauma as people have to see and re-see uh, these killings. And if it wasn't for Steve Weish of the NFL Network, Howard University graduate who had his finger on the pulse of what had been happening in this country over the summer, saw the connection, or at least saw the potential that there might be a connection and went down and spoke to Colin Kaepernick about it. And that's how it got started. And that's how the uproar ensued. And it was really as a response to the uproar that we get the famous story that Colin uh, speaks to a former NFL player who is also a Marine. And they come up with this idea of taking a knee because in one of the great miscalculations of our time, thought it would actually calm the haters down that it was actually a movement of dignity and wanting the United States to be the best it could possibly be. Bring me back to where we are now, because he just had a preseason with the Las Vegas, Las Vegas Raiders. The Raiders have hired the offensive coordinator from the New England Patriots and Josh McDaniels. They have an incredible quarterback. Uh, they got Devontae Adams from the Green Bay Packers. And the Raiders have historically been a franchise that has pretty much given their middle finger to the NFL, right? I, 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 I thought... They for sure that Cap was actually going to have a legit chance to play with the Raiders. Do you think there's any chance he gets signed? When the Raiders news came out, I really did think to myself, there's some hope here. Because I knew McDaniels liked him. And I knew Mark Davis and the tradition, the, the franchise owner and the tradition of his father, Al Davis, had just had enough. Uh, with the way the NFL had been treating him. And so I thought the stars are really aligning here, but we haven't seen it. And now training camp is done. And despite all of Mark Davis's words about this being a franchise that would be open to Colin Kaepernick, you're just not seeing it. That's why uh, Dr. Harry Edwards, the great sports sociologist, he calls it the canary in the coal mine uh, in terms of the place of the black athlete in US society. He said, if you look at how black athletes are treated, it is usually a precursor to how people are going to be treated culturally throughout every community. If they're being told to be silenced, you're going to start to see that ripple through the society. And, you know, it, it's hard not to see that as prophetic, given the state of the country right now. Dave, that was one of the things actually on my pod recently I had a conversation with my ESPN colleague and host of First Take, Stephen A. Smith, about this. And he took us on a journey, a flashback to the NFL setting up a workout for Cap, but there seemed to be a dispute over signing a waiver and Cap instead held his own workout at a high school facility. You know, can you just take me through your take on that whole situation? Because Stephen A. pretty much said that's why he was blackballed. Because of that opportunity that he chose to deny to do it his way, that left an extra bad taste in a lot of owners and the league's mouth. Well, do you remember the t-shirt that Kaepernick wore that day? It said simply Kunta Kinte on it. Kunta Kinte, of course, the protagonist of Roots. The part where the name is most projected in Roots at its most powerful is when LeVar Burton, as Kunta Kinte, is being whipped and told to accept the name of Toby. And he refuses and keeps saying, Kunta Kinte, Kunta Kinte. And to me, this was about Colin Kaepernick saying, I want to go back in the National Football League, but I'm not going to do it on bended knee. And I think what Stephen A., with, with all due respect, I think he, he doesn't include that the NFL wasn't going to allow any recording of the actual workout doesn't include that was being held on a day where there's no way a head coach could have actually come it was going to be people on the most lower end of the scouting totem pole and it, they were going to do it in conditions that uh he was going to have no control over now obviously you're dealing with a situation where there's not a lot of trust and so if you're talking about a situation where okay we're not going to be able to independently videotape it uh, it's going to be people who don't have really any power in the National Football League so they can come out and say whatever they want about the workout and it'll just be like our word against theirs. And so Colin Kaepernick was saying, you might t turn this into a circus, but I'm not going to be a clown. I'm not going to be Toby. After the break, we look to athletes who've been overlooked in their activism. That means we're talking female athletes and that means we're talking Brittany Griner. This is The Limits from NPR. Stay with us. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Discover. Discover could talk about how complicated other banks make credit card rewards, like how there are minimums, or worse, rewards that flat out expire. 
but they rather talk about how with Discover, you can redeem your rewards for cash in any amount at any time. Talk about amazing. And now that you've had that talk, it's time to get back to what this podcast talks about. Learn more at discover.com slash redeem rewards. Terms apply. If Tom Brady or Steph Curry were in Brittany Griner's situation, would we be covering sports like everything was normal? I think you know the answer to that question. Hey, I want to pivot one second uh, to one of those groups in that contested plane that you have made mention of before. You know, my mother's name is Althea Williams, named after obviously Althea Gibson, the first black woman to win Wimbledon. It brings me back to something you said on the Burn It All Down podcast. You said you wanted to feature in your book some semblance of balance in terms of women athletes and men athletes because women athletes are such a part of this. Can you talk about the history and impact of female athletes speaking out and why they're often so overlooked in the media? First and foremost, you know, there wouldn't be a a Black Lives Matter movement without the heroic intervention of black women. I mean, as leaders and as organizers of that movement. So it also shouldn't surprise us that in the world of athletics, uh, you also have the presence of women athletes taking a lead on a lot of different planes, particularly at the collegiate level. And so, yeah, there were football players, but there were also a lot of softball players. There were also a lot of women's soccer players. There were also a lot of people from the cheer squad. And that was another really interesting story is that oftentimes the cheerleaders took a knee because the football team wouldn't because they were scared about losing their scholarship. And there would be debates with the football team And a lot of the cheer squad said, well, if you're not going to step up, then we will. Howard University is is just one of of many cheer stories I have in the book. And I I spoke to a young woman named Sydney Stallworth. You know, there were protests in D.C. where I live on an almost nightly basis. And there was a lot of pain in the community. And the football team wanted to do something. But at the last moment, they they got cold feet. And I'm not going to judge them for that because you are taking a risk anytime you protest, particularly as a scholarship athlete. But at the same time, and this is a darn shame, Jay, but it's the risk that gives the protest its power. That's why if, if, you know, when Nancy Pelosi took a knee wearing a kente cloth, I mean, who, who really cared? At that point, she was she wasn't risking. There's no risk there. Uh, But when an athlete does it, There's a risk factor and there's a tradition and that imbues it with an importance. According to Sidney Stallworth, like when they saw that the football team wasn't going to act, they felt a responsibility at Howard to act. So people wouldn't think that, okay, you have protests going on all around Howard and on the campus of Howard, which is right in the middle of DC for folks who don't know, but that it was actually in this athletic space as well. And that was going to be represented. And I'll never forget, Sydney said that she was nervous afterwards. She didn't know what the reaction would be. And then she went to a local coffee shop just off Howard's campus. And someone had posted up a big photo of her on the bulletin board. The, the barista was like, oh, is, is that you up there taking the knee? Stories like that are what really make me happy because not every story, a lot of the stories have rough endings of athletes who took a knee in terms of what happened to them and their families. But this was one of the good ones. And sometimes bravery does reap uh, just rewards. So Dave, in 2011, you co-wrote a book with track legend John Carlos. He and Tommy Smith raised the black power fist in the 1968 Olympics on the podium receiving their medals just six months after Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination. But there's a lesser known protest of a female track star, Wyomia Tyus. How about her? Once again, a story that's overlooked, right? Well, let's talk about the disrespect that Ty, as her friends call her, received. And that disrespect to me is best seen in 1988, not 1968. Because in 1988, Carl Lewis won the 100 meter dash for the second straight Olympics. And this was highlighted like, oh, the first person ever to win the 100 in consecutive Olympics. When it's like, Ty did it in 64 and 68. And yet, because she's a woman, maybe? Or was it because after she won her second gold in 68 in the 4x100 relay that she held up her medals and said, we dedicate these to John Carlos and Tommy Smith? And this was a huge deal, not only because it showed solidarity as Carlos and Smith were being excoriated to the point of which they had to leave Mexico City with their families uh, because it just was not a safe atmosphere 
not only was it huge for that reason, but it was also huge because the movement itself, which is sometimes referred to as the revolt of the black athlete, did a very poor job of reaching out to black women and black women athletes. It was largely a male movement. And this is something that people who are involved in that movement, like John Carlos, very much regret to this day because they know they would have been stronger by enlisting that kind of help. And believe me, Wyoming Atias was very aware that her and her colleagues had not been reached out to in, in, the, in the lead up to those Olympic Games. So the fact that she still spoke out, it also taught a lesson to the people who were part of the movement about an opportunity wasted, given the, the incredible human capital and strength that existed on the women's side of the USA track and field team. I want to go to the WNBA for a second. Brittany Griner is still being held captive in Russia. Lindsay Kagawa Colas is her agent. Her and I talk all the time about, you know, the action items that are in place. And for the longest time that there was no contact between this administration and her wife and the lack of communication and a lot of the anger and frustration that existed in how you go about this negotiation. Um, what are your what does this say about how American sports teams and leagues value women athletes? Mm, the situation that she's in right now is horrific. Brittany Griner has a serious fan base of people who are utterly passionate about her well being, not to mention colleagues throughout the the WNBA who want the best for her. And they were told upon news of Brittany Griner's detention by the State Department to not speak out. Mm -hmm. that, and I'm sure you're very familiar with this, they were yes. told that you got to keep it quiet because this is the way we're going to bring Brittany Griner home. Tactically, that concerned me. I was speaking a lot to hostage negotiators, people who'd been hired by the State Department for similar situations. What were and, they saying, Dave? Oh my goodness. They were saying this strategy by the State Department is wrongheaded because it doesn't really take into account the fact that our relations with Russia are in a very terrible place because at that time was the very start of Russia's invasion into Ukraine and we're arming Ukraine in response to that. And there are all sorts of threats going back and forth between Putin and Biden and the like. And so the idea that we were gonna find some two guys were just gonna sit down and work out our freedom, that just didn't seem very likely. So then what's the alternative strategy? The alternative strategy is to raise her name to the heavens and be as loud as possible and try to create some form of social pressure, both on the Biden administration to make sure that Brittany Griner's freedom is at the top of their to-do list and on Putin himself. Didn't that essentially give Russia and Putin leverage? Because isn't that what they want? Don't they want to exemplify egg on the face of the United States of America? Absolutely. And that that's the risk. I mean, we're talking about a series of bad choices. Uh, do you stay silent and let Brittany Griner just effectively rot behind bars in a justice system that has very little in common with the word justice? Or do you raise her name and make sure the Biden administration is doing everything they can? I mean, clearly there's been a dramatic shift in strategy. I mean, I can tell you the difference between the NCAA Women's Final Four, where it was almost eerie about people not mentioning Britney's name. Um, I know someone there who was handing out free Britney Griner buttons. People were scared to take them. I mean, like a real sense of like, we are not allowed to talk about this. Like the gap between that and then the w and then when the WNBA season started and the way it shifted dramatically was really about a shift that occurred with the Griner family, with Britney's wife, Sherelle, uh, saying enough is enough. I'm tired of being silent about this. I feel like the Biden administration is not doing all it, all it can. So that's the section of the sports world that loved Britney Griner so much that they they were just waiting to speak out about her and frustrated that they couldn't speak out, but willing to be silent, even though it went against their every instinct and every emotion because they wanted to see her freed. And I respect that. I respect that. But then you've got the sports world that just didn't love Brittany Griner enough. I did an interview with her during the time of George Floyd. It was one of the most thought provoking interviews I had ever done. You know, her father was a police officer and she talked about really having a hard time as relating to what the police that she knew 
stood for in society and how it was being politicized and charged of a conversation while also dealing with being a black woman and being part of the LGBTQ community and dealing with those challenges as well. And she was almost split in how she looked at it. You know, at the time where people had extreme takes, it was a very conservative kind of middle grounded approach that I wish more people would have heard because they would have seen the good of both areas, but like it didn't get the attention that I feel like somebody like Brittany DeGriner deserved. That makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. We could even say that about a ton of WNBA athletes who stood up bravely. I mean, it was WNBA athletes who protested during the anthem before Kaepernick did. They didn't take a knee. They wore black shirts and held hands. And they also pledged, at least the Minnesota Lynx pledged, and this is an amazing protest, that they would only talk to media after the games if it was about politics. Like they actually wouldn't talk about the game. It had to be about political action and what we needed to do to confront racial inequity and police brutality. But that, that certainly hasn't been written about or discussed as the legacy of 2016 and the intersection of the Black Lives Matter movement and sports. And, and that gets to what I was saying about a section of the sports world loved her so much and a section of the sports world just didn't love her enough. If that was Tom Brady or Steph, there would be a counter uh, on sports shows where they would have like the number of days they were behind bars. Dave Zirin is clearly someone who thrives in finding nuance and coming to terms with hypocrisy in sports. But I had to ask him, how do you stay a fan when the business of sports can feel so incredibly unjust? More after the break. This is The Limits from NPR. I'm Jay Williams. You better stay with us. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Framebridge. From art prints and posters to photos sitting on your phone, Framebridge will custom frame your item and deliver your finished product directly to your door, ready to hang. Instead of the hundreds you pay at a framing store, the Framebridge prices start at $39 and all shipping is free. Get started today. Go to framebridge.com and use promo code LIMIT to save an additional 15% off your first order. Welcome back to The Limits, I'm Jay Williams. And we're back with sports writer and author Dave Zyra. Obviously, you look at sports through the lens of politics and civil rights and gender equality and critiques of capitalism and all that is very important. How the hell do you balance that with just being a sports fan? I live in a world called hypocrisy. And <laughs> that, and I have to be comfortable with that hypocrisy. And that hypocrisy is rooted in the fact that I grew up playing sports. I grew up loving sports and sports run just so deep in my DNA. I mean, I grew up in New York City of the 1980s. That means the 86 Mets. That means- Oh, you're a Mets fan. Ugh. Yes, okay, we have a chance this year. Yes, we do, and it's gonna happen. And so I have always believed that sports is art the way opera is art. Yet you never hear people say, hey, you have a lot of critiques of movies, for example, and the way they're made. Why do you watch movies? Hmm. You never hear that. I don't want to reject sports. I want to reclaim it. And I would never reject art, even if art is profoundly distorted by the society and by that we live in and by injustice, because art is what makes us human. Art is what makes life worth living. And I believe that sports needs to have that kind of a critique where you want to reclaim it and reclaim what's best about it. Let's talk about the art of living. You know, obviously the NFL has been struggling with some CTE issues. It's been well documented. The first NFL game of the year is September 8th. The Rams are facing the Bills. It's gonna be one hell of a game, Matthew Stafford versus Josh Allen. This year has been a little bit different. Have you seen any benefits from these new foam helmets that players have been wearing at, at you know training camp or anything else that have been keeping players safe? I, I certainly hope so. We, we need more data. We need more time with it. Uh, we need to see how players respond to it. You know, we've heard, you know, some gripings towards it uh, from players. Uh, we've heard other ones say that they're glad they have something that keeps us safe. But, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with this in a way that's very personal right now because I have a movie coming out, Jay, called Behind the Shield, a documentary mm. about the NFL. And so this is my life is pointing out these problems with the NFL with regards to gender, race, head injuries, all of it. And at the same time, my son is the 14-year-old JV quarterback at Montgomery Blair High School. Wow. And this is his dream. I mean, this is the fruits of me saying to my son as he grew up, you know, there are a lot of problems with the NFL. Now it's Sunday at 1 o'clock. Let's watch. 
you know, because that's basically been my life with my child is explaining the problems, but also enjoying the product. And for him, the product has won out over the critique. And now I just pray he stays safe. When I see some defensive linemen, when I see these guys who are 6'5", 320, like run a 4'4", I'm like, what the hell is going on here? To, to, that, that precision could slightly be off, and that is life-altering. Like, how do you even practice, even with good habits, the elements of the game take you in so many different ways. How do you even prepare your son for those type of things as they happen? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the future of the sport depends upon people developing these good habits and not hurting each other because the game is bigger, stronger, faster. I do want to dig a little bit deeper into what football means for me because football, that word, has always meant international football. It's meant soccer to me. And we have the World Cup coming up in Qatar in November and December. Specifically, you've detailed the disastrous human rights record over in Qatar. Uh, given that people will still be tuning in, what should they know, Dave? I mean, they have to know that dozens of workers, largely from Bangladesh, uh, have had their passports taken away when they enter the country, haven't been paid, been forced to live in horrific conditions, and dozens have died just in the construction of the stadiums that you're seeing in Qatar. And what that's connected to is a much broader system of labor abuses that exist throughout the country where they go. I mean, Qatar is a very rich petro state. So where do you find the workers in a very wealthy petro state? You go to countries that are immiserated in poverty. You bring them over by the thousands to do the actual work needed for a society to run. And since Qatar has even been has even been awarded the World Cup, there are estimates that put the number of labor deaths as high as 6,000 that have just taken place in the country in the years since they got the World Cup with, as I said, dozens taking place for just the construction of the stadiums themselves. I think that people need to be aware of that, but there's a flip side that people need to be also aware of because of the very brave work of international labor organizations and Amnesty International the existence of the World Cup has allowed for a spotlight on these labor abuses like nothing in the history of the country or even the region. And that has led at least to promises of reform. Now, far too often with these mega events, whether they're in China or the United States for that matter, you see these promises of what will be what they call the legacy of the Olympics or the legacy of the World Cup. Now, sometimes that legacy comes to pass. Far too often, it simply does not come to pass. So the hope here, there's been a lot of terrific reporting about Qatar. The hope here is that people won't turn away to the next issue and will keep a light on what happens in the years to come there because that's where you get into real serious trouble. Like once people feel like the cameras are gone and can go back to business as usual. As you continue to do this and have this role within the sports industry, what kind of effect do you hope to have when it's all said and done? I just hope that I can continue, even in this era of micro data, to be able to write a graceful sentence and maybe change your mind or two so people can think about the world in a different way through sports. My, my goals could not be more humble. I just want to clear the lowest possible hurdle to just make people think a little bit about the sports that they consume. Dave, I appreciate your words of wisdom. I appreciate your insight, how informative you are. And we have to do this again, my man. This was a treat today. I'd love to. And Jay, let me tell you, you're as good as it gets in terms of doing this work. And you, you give me hope that the former athlete can fill the role that's needed to be filled. Because far too often, as you well know, it's the former athlete can get jobs ahead of the person who didn't play but who has something to say. And sometimes that can be frustrating, but then I see you doing the work and I'm like, there is a sweet spot that does exist with really, really good journalism and somebody who actually played the game and can speak about it from that perspective. Well, I appreciate your kind words, Dave, and, and you and I are gonna connect after this because I, I wanna continue the work. Like what are plausible strategies that we can actually implement to create change? And that's the work and it's worth doing. Mm. And the one thing people can do it's so easy to do is to be 
a sports fan that sees yourself as a subject of the sports world and not an object of the Hmm. sports world. You, even as a fan, are an agent of change. You are somebody that can support athletes who are bringing politics in the sports world. You are someone who can demand justice in the sports world. We got to remember, these games belong to all of us. We cannot be passive observers because the stakes are too high. You know, there's an old expression, you better turn on the politics or politics will turn on you. Hmm. I think people have to turn onto the politics of sports or the politics of sports will turn on us. That's Dave Zirin, sports editor for The Nation magazine and host of the Edge of Sports podcast, closing out with one hell of a mic drop. His most recent book is called The Kaepernick Effect, Taking a Knee, Changing the World. In this week's Plus episode, we discuss activist athletes from an earlier generation whose stories resurfaced in the wake of Colin Kaepernick taking a knee. You don't want to miss that. And as always, remember, stay positive and let's keep it moving.